Good evening and welcome to this Maundy Thursday service. Um, Would you please stand if you are able as we join together in our call to worship. Come and remember the love of Jesus gathered at the table with his friends. Come, kneel at the feet of our Lord and learn from him. Come and contemplate our Lord, who calls us to stand watch as he prays in the garden. And his love for us Let us worship together and reflect upon the life of Christ.
Would you hear the first scripture lesson for this evening comes from Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the, the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. And this is the word of God for the people of God.
I have to look this up momentarily. That's kind of scary seeing that I'm the one giving the sermon. <laughs> All right. Let's hear the word of God. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you are going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and had returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, Servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Then Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. So the Latin um, word for commandment is mandatum. And that's where we get the, the English translation of the Latin word mandatum for Monday Thursday. That's where that comes from. And so to boil it down to the basic elements is that this day is a day that we remember the command that we love one another. Now, if you're wondering where I got that from, I looked it up on the internet. But I'll have to say something about this congregation and this church, because there are a number of you who know people or you yourself or have kids who can understand Latin almost fluently. Um, you, you study it. They see these students in our, our youth ministry. I have a, a number of students here at Middletown who, in our youth ministry, um, they know Latin well. And I can remember as I first had my first couple months here, being in conversations, and, and so like for the first maybe two paragraphs of the, the Latin conversation, my head was like, yes, yes, Latin, yes. And then all of a sudden, they would take it to a different direction, and then all of a sudden, I was like, I am lost. Like, okay, you, you've gone beyond me. I all of a sudden realized um, that I don't really comprehend this conversation. I don't really know what's going on. 
Now, you might have guessed that the students I'm referring to, they go to Highland Latin School. And, and why it took me so long to figure out, it was almost like an epiphany one day. I was like, Highland Latin School. And there's a, you know, if you've ever bought a, a video game for maybe a grandchild or, or someone's bought a video game and, and it's a sports-related video game, um, and it's, it might be made by EA Sports. And they had this slogan for years that was, it's in the game. So like if you play football and there's something in football, it's going to be in the EA Sports game. If you played soccer, it's going to be in the game. Well, all of a sudden it was like Highlands Latin School. It's in the name. Like, so, so how could I have missed that? But I have to say this, and, and, I, and I don't know if you've ever had that experience, and I'm not talking about being able to speak Latin. What I'm referring to tonight is this like, yeah, I get it, right? I get it. And then you're like, wait a minute, I, I don't get it. I don't, maybe, maybe you've seen this in your life. You know, I kind of think about like when you're talking to a child, like maybe even the child that stole the cookie from the cookie jar. And so you're trying to explain to the child, now you know it's, it's, it's not a right to take the cookie. And the child's like, yeah, I know. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, I don't. Because they're good. And I just want a cookie. You know? So you think they're getting it and they don't. Or maybe in your, your profession. Maybe you're a manager or a leader and you're explaining things to, to your company or your teacher and you're explaining things to students. And as you're trying to help them understand the new process or procedure, you just begin to get this understanding that there's a couple of them that, that are nodding yes, but you know they're not right there with you. Well, what I'm talking about tonight, that kind of yes and then wait, I don't really understand. I feel like we get a glimpse of that's what's happening at the Passover meal with Jesus, with the disciples. And you can just kind of see these different characters who are revealing like, yes, I get this. And then now they're shaking their head. No, I don't. Now, Passover would have been very common. They would have been absolutely 100% used to a Passover meal together. What they would have not have gotten used to is Jesus getting up and taking off his outer clothes, wrapping a towel around his waist, and beginning to clean their feet. And so you can, you can kind of see Peter, and if Jesus is coming to Peter, Peter's, Peter's response is really quick and to the point, like, you are not going to do this. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus basically is sharing with him, you know what, I have to. If I don't do this, you're not a part of me. And then there's Peter who basically says, wash my hands and my head as well. You know, it's almost like Peter switches gears completely. It's like, hey, whole bath, Lord, right? Let's just take care of it all. And now, you know, Jesus isn't one I think that would roll his eyes, but there's this moment where he just has to pause and lovingly explain, you don't, you don't need your hands clean. You don't need your head clean. It's just your feet. And Peter's kind of sitting there going, I get it. Yeah, I don't get it. And then there's another character in this story, and his name isn't necessarily specifically mentioned, but we know that Jesus says someone's going to betray him. And, and even that night, as, as Judas is going to betray Jesus, Judas is sitting there going, I get this. Like, we need a king who's going to fight for us, a king with a sword. And as Jesus is washing feet, you can just only imagine Judas, as he's talking about this commandment, like, finally, a command. He's going to tell us our marching orders. And that command is to love one another. Love one another. And Jesus could just see him kind of be like, yes, and then go, no. No. Thankfully, brothers and sisters, there is somebody who, who understood, who knew what was going on the night at that table, the night of that feast. And that person was Jesus. You see, the scriptures are absolutely beautiful. And the scripture in Hebrews says, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Jesus lived in that state all of the time as he was holy and perfect. And he approached that meal with his disciples, knowing that when he left, he was going to approach his suffering. When he left that meal, he was going to approach his disciples scattering. When he left that meal, he was going to approach the cross and die. And when he left that meal, he knew that he was going to approach victory through God. Jesus knew. He fully knew what was going on and why it was happening. Now, for us today, I think that sometimes we get lost in this whole idea about washing feet. 
Now, now don't worry, we're not going to wash feet tonight. You guys can be like, whoo, breathe a little sigh of relief. But to them, it was so cultural and it was so grounded. See, for Peter to see Jesus wash feet and then come to him to want to wash his feet, it was scandalous, right? I mean, like, I think for us, it would be awkward, but it wouldn't be scandalous. Because in Jesus' day, when you had a social function, when you had somebody over at your home, there was, there was a servant, there was a worker, there was the, the person on the low end of the totem pole, and they would be responsible for washing the feet of the guests that came to the door because their roads were dusty and they had open-toed shoes, and, and it was a dirty job, one that should never, in Peter's mind, been assigned to Jesus. And I think that's really challenging for us to, to translate that into our culture because we don't live that way. You don't go over to someone's house and they're like, take your shoes off, let me wash them. And so I thought about this, and as I, I thought about this in reflection, I thought about in my own life what that might look like. Like in my life, that might look like coming home and going down my driveway and then turning the corner, and my house has a septic system, right? And then Jesus is digging a ditch, and he's getting into the pipes because the family septic system is backed up. And to see Jesus doing that, to say, no, you, you don't do that. That's not, you don't do that. That's not your job, Lord. Or in a youth ministry context, taking a group of, of middle schoolers to, to a movie and, and usually remembering after the movie's over, hey, everybody, hey, kids, clean up the trash, Pick up your trash. And even then, it's still a disaster. But forgetting that, right? And walking out that movie theater door, and in comes Jesus in the movie theater outfit, and he's got the stuff to clean up the mess, and just to be thinking, stop. Don't do that. It's not, it's not your job. That's not how you're supposed to serve. Or I think about a little girl, you know, in a, in a trash heap. And getting plastic and glass and, and trying to pull together just enough to get something for her family to eat. And that is so below Jesus. Friends, tonight, tonight is an invitation. It's an opportunity, really. And it is a beautiful opportunity for us as a, as a, a Christ-centered community to share at the table of Jesus together. But, but I, I want to be a little transparent that, that, that the table is so beautiful and yet it, 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 it comes with a little bit of tension. See, we celebrate an open communion table. Jesus welcomes all to the communion table. All may approach the table. All are welcome to come to the table. If you earnestly are seeking after Jesus, this table is for you. And yet when you take that cup and that bread and you remember the sacrifice that Christ has made for you, that open invitation, it also comes with a command. Love one another. So I want to invite you tonight as we are getting ready to prepare our hearts to receive communion, I want to invite you to, to use your imagination, to use your senses, to use your eyes. And maybe this room right now isn't the moment for you, but sometime tonight when you get a moment to be in a quiet place, I, I invite you, I invite you to feel Jesus wash your hands, I invite you to, to feel the towel as he's cleaning your feet. I invite you to, to look into his eyes and to see that loving wonder and that power and that grace and that invitation to be near him as he looks at you and he says, do you know what I have done for you? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you spend a moment in prayer with me?
Holy God, you are worthy of all of our praise. We began this Lenten, this Lenten journey weeks ago, and, and today we have arrived with you and your disciples in the upper room. We remember your servant's heart as you washed the disciples' feet. So Lord, help us to have that same servant's heart so that our compassion for our neighbors will cause us to reach out and serve them in whatever way they may need. Lord, we listen tonight as you warn those closest to you that, you would, that, that they would betray you, they would deny you, they would desert you. But you never stop loving them. Lord, we, your people, we often betray you, deny you, desert you. So forgive us, O oh God. And Lord, we will have people in our lives who will betray, deny, and desert us. Help us have your heart so that we can forgive and continue to love them. As you gather with your disciples for the Passover feast, we not only remember God's great acts, but you, in that Passover feast, lifted up the great acts of God. But you also that night instituted a new and holy sacrament for your church. Tonight, we remember your blood that was shed and your body that was broken for us. But this holy sacrament is more than just a time to remember. It's also a time to experience your very real presence in this holy meal. So, Lord, open our hearts that we might receive you and receive your grace. Tonight, we pray for peace in the midst of a world that knows war and violence. We pray for healing for those who are broken in body, mind, and spirit. We pray for comfort for those who grieve. Lord, hear our prayers tonight as we worship you. And we offer this prayer to you in the name of Christ, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray, and free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And would you take a moment in silence to offer up your own personal words of confession? Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen.
Would you join me in the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. From the earth you bring forth bread and create the fruit of the vine. You formed us in your image, delivered us from captivity, and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and gave grapes as an evidence of the promised land. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When, he had, when we had turned aside from your way and abused your gifts, you gave us in Christ your crowning gift, emptying himself that our joy might be full. He fed the hungry, healed the sick, ate with the scorned and forgotten, washed the feet of his disciples, and gave a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and vine. Make them be for us body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by Christ. And by your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. As Nathan told you in his message a few moments ago, communion table in United Methodist Church is open to everyone. You do not have to be a member of the United Methodist Church, or this congregation to celebrate this sacrament with us. So we invite all of you to come and share in this meal that has been prepared for us. We will receive communion if you, as you come forward. The ushers will direct you. They will, the servers will hand you a piece of bread with a pair of tongs. We're trying to be as safe as possible. And then we have the small cups. If you want to kneel for a time of prayer, you're welcome to do that. And you can leave your cups there. If you don't want to kneel, there are baskets at the end of the outer uh, kneelers where you can put your empty cups. If you're still uh, not comfortable with communion this way, there are the self-contained communion elements in these little baskets here. would encourage you, if you want, to use one of those. Also encourage you, if you've got family or friends at home who can't be in church and you'd like to take communion to share with them, take some uh, extra ones of those that you might share with your family and your friends. And then finally, we have gluten-free wafers uh, for those of you who may need those. I'd like to invite those who are going to assist uh, to meet us here in the front.
I invite you to come. You are 
Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you Oh Lord, on this Holy Thursday, You have fed us with Your Word. You have fed us with this holy meal. You have nourished us to face tomorrow. One of the most painful days in the life of the church. But even as we face the pain of tomorrow, we know today that Sunday is coming. And we give You praise. In Christ's holy name, amen. benediction through the blessing of the holy trinity may we all leave this place knowing that we may approach the throne of god that we are loved and we are commanded let us love one another amen mm -hmm.